Right, thank you. That's right. We'll call the meeting to order December 5th at 7 p.m. And this is a special meeting. Um, and so I'll open with the statement of civility. Uh, as your appointed governing board, we will treat each other, members of the public and city employees with patience, civility and courtesy as a model of the same behavior we wish to reflect in South Pasadena for the conduct of all city business and community participation. The decisions made today will be for the benefit of the South Pasadena community and not for personal gain. And a notice on public participation accessibility, you can find uh, details in the, um, the, the agenda packet today uh, available on Zoom. Uh, on the website, you can connect by Zoom uh, as described there. And so let's um, go on to roll call if we could, Melanis. Hello. Hi. So we have Chair Law. Here. We have uh, Vice Chair Hammond. Here. Commissioner Bortz. Here. Commissioner Husagin. Here. Uh, Commissioner Jones has an excused absence. Commissioner Siegel. Here. And Commissioner Tom. Here. Thank you. Uh, Council liaison Michael Cacciotti is not pre currently present. Uh, staff present, we have Ted Gerber, Public Works Director, and myself, Melanie Stepanian. Okay, thank you. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so let's move on. And um, are there any general public comments? Uh, I guess we only have one actually. <laughs> uh, general comments, not specific to the agenda item, right? We have no general public comment that was submitted via email or written in person. If anybody would like a chance to have a written public comment card or speak about anything that's not related to an agenda item, a general public comment, feel free to speak now and we'll give our Zoom participants a chance to speak as well. Please raise your hand on Zoom if you would like to speak. Hi, I know you just attended, but we are having our general public comment. If you have something that doesn't pertain to an agenda item, feel free to speak now. Okay, well, I think we can close general concludes. public comment. We have no general public comment submitted online, written, or in person. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we can move on to agenda item two, which is the continuation of the tree hearing for the uh, 1865 Hanscom Drive um, property. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Good evening. So um, this item is related to the proposed removal of four significant trees at 1865 Hanscom. Um, this item was heard at our October 25th um, NRAC meeting. Um, there was a discussion and one of the main comments that came out of that was a preference for there be, to be an opportunity uh, for um, a public works department to try to conduct a site visit for the commissioners. Um, so we did conduct a site visit um, in mid-November um, and there was some turnout. Uh, it wasn't what we had hoped in terms of having people uh, be able to view the site. And so we decided to um, cancel our regular meeting prior to Thanksgiving and schedule this uh, special meeting so that we would have the opportunity to allow uh, commissioners to visit the site. And one of the requests in the previous commission was to um, have our city arborist on site also to answer some questions for the commissioners. The um, property owner applicant also invited um, the uh, applicants arborist and also opened the invitation to some of the community members in the area to visit the site as well. And so that uh, second site visit was held uh, this morning. Um, and so uh, we don't have much to elaborate on in terms of the uh, data for the report. Um, however, there was you know, some robust conversation at the site. And I think some of the commissioners who attended might have been more informed in, in the situation. I know that our um, we had asked our arborists to advise us as city staff, and that's the what the 
um, foundation for our recommendation is in terms of recommending the removal of the trees. Um, more so linked to a structural deficiency than the health of the trees. Um, however, I, I'll open it up to the commission to discuss further if they'd like, and we can answer any questions that you have. And uh, I actually was not able to attend the October meeting, so I'm a little, aside from today, I'm a little out of the loop. I did attend the site today, but can you, is the, is there any um, updated documentation in this packet? Sure, um, we provided a link uh, to the former, um, the former October 25th staff items. There was a very brief staff report and then public comments that accompanied it. I give you a brief background related to the staff report. Um, the Public Works Department had received uh, an, an application um, for a private property tree removal. There was a, initially an application that had um, intended to be associated with development. However, th there was an amended application submitted that was not associated with development, and that's the application that's being considered for this evening. And so of the, uh, in that initial application, the applicant had asked for a request for more trees than what is being requested tonight, but it was eventually narrowed to just the amended uh, four trees. And so it includes, um, I don't have the tree types listed in the staff report, but I think it's a, an oak, a Chinese elm, uh, an Aleppo pine, and an Italian stone pine from memory. Um, so our staff took, performed a site visit early on in the process, um, and we were advised by our city arborist about the structural deficiency of the trees. And then we also took into account the um, recommendations submitted from the applicant's arborist in that decision. Well, I'm sorry, that recommendation to the counts, to the commission, we didn't make a decision. We're, we're bringing the decision before the commission. Right, thank you. And just to be clear, the first, uh, before the rev revised application, how many trees were on that list? So there was an inventory of 29 trees and um, there was a removal um, designation of 14 trees in that initial list. And that the revised application was four down from-, from That's right, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry to make everyone catch up. Of course. <laughs> but, um, so maybe um, in that case, we can just go to questions. I think it would be appropriate for the commission to take, um, take a pass at asking questions maybe of uh, of, of uh, Ted Gerber. So, um, Commissioner Tom, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I don't. I I actually attended a uh, site visit uh, the week prior, and it was just me, the city staff, and then um, the applicant and the applicant's arborist. Um, so I'm really interested in hearing what the conversation was today, and I'm happy to share what I heard. But I'm interested to hear more about that as well as uh, what other folks have said. So I don't really actually have anything for Ted. Mr. Gerber at this point, but um, I may as, as this goes forward. Yeah, sure, maybe we'll do one pass with questions and then we can sure. go around discussion. I wasn't here for the October one as well, so I'm I'm interested in hearing everybody else's questions and kind of the the summary of the two visits. Uh, but I defer to the other. Uh, thank you. Um, so based on the, um, on the site visit today, um, speaking, you know, listening to the owner's arborist, um, describe everything, um, I had, we had a chance to also talk to the independent arborist. And so, uh, from my sense, and I would, uh, wondering if you agree, Ted, it sounds like the, uh, independent arborist, uh, agrees with the owner's arborist uh, assessment? The conclusions are the same. I think from what I understood, their um, approach to that might be slightly different, but um, the city's arborist conclusion um, was that, uh, you know, particularly for the um, pine trees, there's structural deficiency in the way that they've grown over time and uh, in noting how the um, root base is secured to the soil or that lack thereof. Um, the way that the, our 
city arborist described. There's one tree that's the, um, I think it's the Aleppo pine that's basically was at some point behind a, a brick retaining wall. Um, I'm sorry, that was the Italian stone pine. Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, that the way our arborist had described it, um, the, the tree roots had grown in such a way as a result of being um, somewhat incorrectly placed behind that wall. Um, and there was no soil surface between the wall and the root structure. And so the tree grew into uh, basically an unstable formation. And so as the wall uh, gave way over time, um, it really didn't matter whether the wall was there or not. The tree had, uh, the downhill side of the tree had grown in such a way. And she was also very concerned about the uphill side of the tree, not having the actual root strength, especially since there's a cavity several feet north. Well, I don't remember which way to switch, but several feet up heat of that tree. And the tree is already sort of growing in a leaning pattern um, that it seemed unsound to her the way that it was secured into the site. Similarly, but not as severe, the Aleppo pine, the other pine that was farther down the hill, also had um, you know, significant dieback up the tree. Uh, the way she had described this was there's a vascular um, issue with the tree, and you can see it in the extent of the dieback and how how far up it goes. There's like branch die off is normal in these in these types of trees to a certain extent, but she felt it was much higher than expected. And this was also confirmed by um, like a lack of a flare root base on the uphill side of that tree. Um, and so also felt that that was um, perhaps uh, not focusing on whether the tree was healthy or not, but the fact that the tree was structurally unsound in its location. Um, I didn't get to talk to her too much about the other trees, the oak tree. Um, it was mentioned that it was significantly uh, cavitated. Um, and then the Chinese elm had sort of grown into a pattern and in such a way that it was actually being supported by the structure that was on site. So um, the, the applicant's arborist had elaborated in different ways um, and came to a similar conclusion about removal and replacement, but that was the advisement that um, really led to our recommend, the advisement from our city arborist that led to the recommendation that we made in the staff report. And uh, can you speak to the independent arborist qualifications? Um, and to our uh, city arborist qualifications, yes. um, I cannot off the top of my head, but I have that documentation here. So let me have a moment here and I could pull that up for you. My apologies, I have a very large document here with lots of information about our arborists team.
So I don't have our particular arborist information in front of me. I could probably get that to you in the next few minutes. I can ask one of our staff members. We have the other some of the other arborist teams from West Coast Arborist, who's our city arborist. They have an array of um, ISA board certified arborists and even one ISA board certified master arborist on staff. Um, but I could find out about specifically about the, the team member who visited today and gave that advisement. Excellent. Um, sure. And were there any other arborists, certified arborists that have visited and either agreed or disagreed with these findings? So the only um, arborists I'm aware that have been able to see the site, visit the site, have been our city arborists and the applicants arborists. I know that the community has also reached out to some arborists who have um, offered some opinion. Um, I don't have specific information on that. I don't know that they were able to visit the site, but that might be something that could be revealed in the public comment component okay. of, the, of the session. Um, and then can you speak to if these trees were removed, um, would they be removed at the stump leaving the root or would they be try to be completely removed roots and all? Our understanding is that the stump would be left in place to secure the, you know, prevent erosion of the soil. I think that's the recommendation. All right, thank you. Um, yes, I'm afraid I also missed the site visit today, but um, I wanted to know whether the applicant's arborist also runs a tree care company. I don't know if you know that or if the applicant can speak to that. No idea. So if if the trees were to be, to be removed, it's not this arborist necessarily that would be doing the work. Like it easier. Yeah, the people on Zoom yeah. can't really hear you. It's true. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> we have to turn it on. Okay. <laughs> Always another button. <laughs> the arborist I hired, um, to my knowledge, does not work for a tree company. He may or may not. I, I really don't know. Um, the quote I got for removal of these trees is from a, uh, I believe it's a West Covina company. So unrelated to the arborist who submitted totally the report. Okay. Um, do you know if your arborist has the ISA tree risk assessment qualification, like a special credential through ISA for tree risk assessment? I do not know. Okay. Um, I think those are all the questions I had. I do not have any questions. I missed the last meeting and also <laughs> the site visit. So very interesting though. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so let's see, we have a choice here. We could um, have more discussion or we could have public comment and then have our discussion. Maybe take a little preference. I would suggest getting it, having the public comment first. Yeah. Okay. So maybe let's um, let's open up for public comment on this item. So, Melanis, can you, um... oh, well, maybe I, we could just open the floor if people have any, submit any cards. Thank you. Would anybody like to submit a public comment card or make a public comment? You have a limit of three minutes if you do come to the podium. Gail wants to see. I'm like the, I'm the voice of everybody who said, would you say this? And uh, Gail wanted me to remind who's sitting in the back. She's another neighbor. And my name is Wendy Ryan, by the way. And she said, remind everyone that in 2011, did I get in this right? 2011, when 1,200 South Pasadena trees fell, those, significant, those four significant trees were fine. No problem. And other trees, other trees had fallen on the hill, but not those trees. So... She wanted me to remind, am I getting that right? Okay. And then Terry, who lives next door, Terry, she said, she said she's looking out her, her window at the beautiful green canopy of the, of these trees. And to, to say that they're dead or they have to come down without maybe a master arborist. Now I'm adding that a master artifact. Arborist. There, to get master credentials in ISA, there's only 2% of the arborist have that master qualification. 
And the reason I got interested in this is I, I just found somebody online and, and he's, and he said, do you have time? Do you, do you understand the code in South Pasadena? And I said, well, I haven't read it yet. He said, do you, do you have time? I'll go over it with you. And I went, sure, but I'm more concerned with your time. But he, he gave me, went through all these code, the code and how important and how important following the code is. And I, I took an interest in it. And then I, I started reading about CEQA, which all of you, I'm assuming, probably know what CEQA is. Do you, is anybody not know? It's California Environmental Quality. Oh, I'm, all these acronyms, I'm having trouble with them. CEQA, and I mentioned a few in a comment that I sent you today. And I'm just learning. I'm, I'm learning like anyone. We're not, Mr. Dr. Embassy's, we're not, we're not against development. We want it done right. If a tree in and I if a tree is a possibility to save that tree, we think that's important. And we do think that the development should that's why I liked a master arborist plan that includes all this mitigation for any impact. This is important stuff, I think, because we're hillside. And and um, we just think this is important, and it's an important decision. You're put in an important decision, um, as is Ted, and we appreciate how hard you've worked. And we just, you know, once I started studying, it's I how could I possibly understand all of this? Why not get the reason a master arborist too? He's not being paid by any he, he would he would be completely independent i don't it's not my friend if we got him or another master arborist it's not my friend it would be completely independent not hired by the city not hired by a developer completely independent decision and i'm i'm probably could we could raise the money to get the money to pay someone to do that so it's not i understand the city wouldn't have that kind of money but there's enough of interest in it that we would hire someone to do that and and give us a give us another opinion and and give us a little bit of that risk pre-construction um pre-construction plans construction guidelines all of that stuff that has to be part of this um project um Terry is there anything else you wanted me to say about any of it? Am I? I'm trying to speak for a lot of people, and right now you probably been, I'm not. So sorry to interrupt. Oh, the I three minutes of time, but if okay, if fine. you would like to, thank speak you very for much. Again, an additional well. time, you can request additional time if you'd like. Just form out, like just formally. If anybody else would like to speak, and just for the record, we did have written public comment, and those are in the additional documents packet. If you would like a copy, commissioners, I have one copy here. If you would like to take a look at some of those comments. Thank you. I'm going to set the timer this time. Hmm. No pressure. <laughs> sure. Okay. I just have something short to say. I, I submitted a comment earlier today. I, in 100 pages of emails between the developer's consultant and public works, there were 45 instances of the word replacement and not a single mention of an actual replacement plan. There was considerable back and forth discussing the technicalities of trees that didn't require permits for removal, yet the two dead trees the fire chief asked to be removed and all of the invasives remained standing. This strikes me as an incredible burden on city resources and on staff who have had to keep all of this information in their head over the course of eight months. I believe asking for a replacement plan early on would have given the, develop the developer the perspective he needed. I believe this ask was undermined by fear mongering and a pursuit of unjustified exemptions. August 1st, the developer's consultant said in an email to Public Works, and I quote, at this point, the potential risks to the owner, the lot, the structure, and the surrounding hillside outweigh the benefits of polite procedure. 
For the record, this all came from a self-professed South Pasadena code enforcement specialist hired by the developer. I believe this sets a bad precedent in how to approach tree removals in the city and in the Monterey Hills specific. Uh, there's a form if you'd like to, yeah, please. Oh, Andrew, I lost. Um, Andrew brought up the qualifications of my arborist. I didn't know what they were, but apparently uh, online he is an ISA qualified arborists, number one. Number two, though I'm a medical doctor, I like to quote the law once in a while. There's a saying in law, res ipsi loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. That oak tree isn't just cavitated. That oak tree is hollow. It's a huge, huge tree, and it's hollow inside. And then when they ask my arborist how he knows it's hollow, he puts his arm in with a pointer and goes all the way to, and when Richard was there, he lost the pointer inside. He lost his pointer way down inside the oak tree. This thing isn't just cavitated, it's hollow. And that doesn't get, there's no cure for that. Not even rebar and concrete is going to solve that problem. Um, so it's, I'm not trying to ruin the neighborhood. I'm just want to deal with four unhealthy, unstructurally challenged trees. Overall, if you were to look it up on the internet. I am Laura Gladding. I live directly above uh, the house that's looking to remove the trees. I just don't have the time, like my other neighbor Wendy said, to learn all of the details of removal and hillside versus construction and all that. But when I did read something, it struck me as if trees are removed, they have to be replaced. But somewhere I read that they don't have to be replaced on that property that they're building on. They can do it somewhere else in the city. And I don't know if that's a fact, but to me, that's absolutely insanity if that's true. So I'd like some sort of input insight on that. And I'd just like to say that um, I think we're all concerned because we walk that walk and those trees are very important to us. And We've seen several houses down the road, mansion, McMansion, massive house, not a single tree is there. They've torn down all the trees. Five houses, one, two, three, four. Four have already been built and another one's going to happen. And there's no more trees. They plant a little tree. But these are massive trees. Nobody knows how many hundred years old, 200 years old. I asked the arborist. He had no clue. He wouldn't even give me a guess today. And I understand if they're bad trees, get rid of them, but do you not replace on the property? Do you just fill it with houses as much concrete as we can? It's my I can attest to a lot of these things. I've lived up on this hill, not as high as everybody else, but I've um, experienced the repercussions of the building that does go on and the trees that are removed. In 1980, I had a landslide that South Pasadena had to come with their fire department and use their hoses to get the mud to come out from behind my house. I looked out the window and the water was up this high at two in the morning from a bad, bad rain. Now, part of it was um, city street that wasn't banked correctly. And part of it was 
the houses that were being built right to the right of me. And I don't know whether they're called townhouses or whether they're called condos. But since then, I've had more landslides, more mud come down, patio filled with mud, and um, city public works, Dan, Dan, Dan Garcia. And I uh, worked things out. But I was the one that had to pay to have all that removed. And most of that had to do with trees that were removed and not replaced. For construction, building right over to the edge, practically, yes, 10 feet, I understand, is the, the rule. But when you put your concrete practically right over to the line anyway, and the water comes down and it comes right down into my property, it's, it's, it's extremely upsetting since I've been a single parent for practically all of these 47 years. I had trees planted in my front yard. They were my little Christmas trees. I didn't understand that an alipo gets to be as tall as it does. I also put in some trees, pine trees that weren't the correct kind. So the Monterey pine got a beetle bark or beetle into the bark. And the city told me that I could not take that tree down um, unless I had an arborist that could verify that it was diseased. And actually, there were two of them, two trees. And so the arborist came. He was independent from, actually, he was well-known, um, an arborist for the Ambassador College. And he came and he verified that the trees were diseased. They would infect my other three pine trees and that I needed to have them removed. City went ahead and said, fine, but you must replace those trees. And here's the answer to that question. If you don't put them on your property, put them someplace else in South Pasadena. So what happens to many of the trees that are being taken out are not being put back on the property. They are put someplace else. And so we have more erosion and lack of trees up on our hill. So I don't live right next to where this is being built, but I walk past there. I know many, many of the neighbors, and I know the people that live down below, and I am concerned about what's going to happen to the dirt that comes down into their yard, into their house, as well as the water and the mud. So yes, I understand if the tree is diseased and it has to be taken down, you know, that happens. But you know, what are they going to do? What are they going to do to keep that from happening to somebody else? Please really consider this. And there should be some plan ahead of time to know any construction that goes on. I know you send me a, a card about construction going on, but, you know, sometimes I feel it's, it, you know, it's just kind of, I'm the little guy. Somebody comes in with a lot of money and builds a huge, huge house on a piece of property and takes many trees out. And I'm thinking of one in particular up above me to this one other side. And they bought, brought those box trees in so the city could see that they bought those trees and brought them in. And then they let them all die because nobody watered them. They were still sitting in their boxes. So uh, um, I have big concerns, obviously, about what's happening here. Hello, oh, I'm Janet Sedgwick, and I live below the property that we've been talking about. One of the houses that kind of share, I guess our property lines must go in between the next house. Three years ago, um, it was the day, Christmas Day, we did have a big mud flow, and I think I sent pictures before in an article or paper that I wrote before that I had sent, and um, they had all this mud that came down from that property as well as um, I think in the past they have um, that site was used probably before we had um, you know developed trash pickup and way many 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 years ago was obviously a huge dumping ground 
and I have found all kinds of antique bottles and we've had all kinds of stuff that has come down that hill. I think the hill has got quite a layer of mulch, which has a lot of junk underneath it that we all can't see. And as erosion takes place, more and more of it comes up. We've had tires come down. We've had parts of cars and glass and everything else. And I know that at the, the grade that that hill is, any kind of anything that's up there will pick up considerable uh, momentum rolling down the hill. And I know that when the neighbor lady had the mudslide there three years ago, because the, the city also sent fire trucks out, we had all the mud that washed out into the street. It filled in her back thing, broke her back patio, it, that all that mud came out and there's still a dam that they have where they stuck in the ground up there. But she had a, a, a air conditioner came rolling down at an incredibly rapid rate. And thank goodness nobody was killed. That could have gone through a window. It could have gone through the side of the wall. And at my house, I have a 15 foot retaining wall behind my house. You know, anything that hits that wall will pop up into the air. I've seen it numerous times. I, I've been planting lantana up there. I know exactly what that soil is like. I know how, I just, I've seen it all up there. I, I know it like the back of my hand. And I just really hope and I pray that if we do have replacement trees, please, please have them put on that property because we need those roots. That hill is so loose. There's so many gopher holes. And if any rain that we have, you can drive down Peterson and see the dirt that comes down with every rain. And we only have one drain that's over in front of my house. There's only one drain that the whole side of Peterson there all drains in that one drain there and my husband has scooped mud out of there the city came the last time it rained and I appreciate that because they sent somebody in to pick up all the mud but I'm really really concerned about the erosion and um, what's underneath all there and I, I really do want roots <laughs> really do want roots up there to help maintain that integrity of our hill because it is a beautiful hill and just like everybody that's up there, we all love our homes. I love being up there. It's so peaceful, so quiet. And it's just such a, a small, our own little community. But the hillside community is a unique community. I mean, it's the trees that you say, those trees that grow on the side of the hill, they aren't the same as ones that grow on the flat land. They don't look the same. All the trees that grow on the side, are all compromised to an extent anywhere that they would be you know so to compare light trees with light trees instead of the trees down here in the flats with the trees that are sitting on a 45 degree angle there's going to be some difference but anyway thank you so much for your consideration thank you so any other comments um, um, actually, what, um, okay, please. So I'm Andrew Imbus. It's a pleasure to meet you all. And I am hopefully one of the future homeowners of this property. And the reason we really would like to get there is because I have a new set of twins. We've I've always admired the South Pasadena School District, and we obviously really, as probably as many of your children have all gone to South Pass, I hope too, well, my children can too. Uh, and I, I'm sorry for a lot of the, the damage that was caused to your house a long time ago with things rolling down the hill. And I think, I think it was also addressed though that they're going to leave the stump to help decrease the amount of corrosion that would happen if you were just to remove the whole tree. I, uh, the trees are dead. The trees are dying. They might not look, they might look okay at the top, but I feel like you've had two reports from two separate arborists who have said the same thing, came to that probably from different angles. However, their conclusions were ultimately the same. And I think ultimately the, the end goal is to you're right, not, not steal trees from South Pasadena, 
not to destroy a community, not to make things look worse, because it's a beautiful hillside. There's no reason to assume that my father and I have any interest in coming into this community and disrupting it, tearing it down, or making it in any which way uh, unlivable or unhabitable for anybody else. That's certainly not our plan. And uh, I hope you guys can see just at the, the base level here what the recommendations were from, from I want to say Ted, but I, and <laughs> the official title, official title is Ted. And I, I hope you guys move to approve it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we might, um, we might ask questions of you as we go along, but um, yeah, since you've had your chance to speak, I think we can go to our own discussion. Um, so I'm, I'll suggest that we close the discussion on this for now and move on to um, our own deliberations here. So um, maybe we'll um, go the other direction. Before you do, can I ask some more clarifying questions to Ted based on some of the comments? We could do that, yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, Commissioner Siegel, why don't you take it away? Um, so listening to some of the comments, sounded like there was concern over construction. But I want to confirm, is this tree removal due to hazard or is it due to uh, construction? Sure. So um, in the tree code, it basically, you know, there's like a binary path. The removal can be associated with development or not associated with development. So in this case, it's not associated with development. Regardless of the future intention of the work on the site, that division comes as, as to um, the review process and the approval authority for the removal. So if this were associated with development, meaning that there was an actual development plan in place, we wouldn't be here today. Um, this would go in a parallel process to the planning commission. But since there isn't, hasn't been a development application put together and submitted to the planning department, it's a non-development tree removal, and that's why it's um, in front of the Natural Resource Environmental Commission. Um, so I ho hopefully that uh, answers the question as to, like, uh, I know there's been uh, talk of future development on the site, future construction on the site, but the moment there isn't a development in place, and that's why we're, we're here under this leg of the process. And so for this, we're more concerned with the hazard of the tree than because that sounds like why we're here, right? We're here because of this, yeah. this particular applications uh, went down the, the non-development path. Exactly. And so, you know, in some cases we could talk about hazard, like if there's a safety concern of the tree falling, which is very um, valid in some cases um, with an uninhabited site that might become less of an issue, but since it is an uphill of other residences, and yes, the collapse of the tree uh, would be an uncontrolled uh, you know, issue. You'd have root pull and you could have some of the hillside come with it. The recommendation from the arborist or the advisement from the city arborist at, at a minimum was that if you were able to remove the tree and leave the stump in place, you'd have a better solution um, in the long run for those for those particular trees. And then uh, finally, if there is development in the future, um, assumption is that they would have to go through the normal city process through the planning department, get various engineering and soil surveys because they're on a hill and doing construction there, correct? Yeah, that's correct. There'd be a process in terms they would have to do, I know, geotechnical review, there'd be slope st st stabilization required. Um, and uh, any further tree removals would still go through our department, but they'd be considered by the planning commission. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, King off of those questions, um, Mr. Gerber, um, we talked about this a little bit relative to replacement last time. I just want to understand because some of the questions came up. To the extent you have these four trees removed now, there is a replacement obligation. The question, there were a couple of questions asked, one of which was, do the replacements have to be on site? Are they off site? Can they be off site? 
what's the story there? And then related to that and related to the idea of development, to the extent that there's a replacement obligation that's imposed because of the removal of these four trees now, does that get added into whatever additional replacement obligations come in um, if development happens? Is there a timetable for when, you know, if for these four trees, if they're removed now, how would that operate? Do they need to do it within six months, 12 months, a year? You know, does development change that timetable? All of those kinds of questions with the idea that, you know, if this were coming in, at least for our purposes, simpler, both because it wouldn't come to this commission and because it would just be clear for the public, you know, if it were a development plan, you'd know all at once, okay, these are the things that are going to be done. Whereas here it gets a little bit complicated because you have, okay, there's some replacement obligation, more trees because they're going to have smaller trunks, you know, what, what will happen? When do they have to get planted? What if the development doesn't happen for two years, three years? How does that all operate? So maybe you can at least broad brush give us a sense of how the ordinance is set up and how the city operates. Sure. Yeah, all very good questions. Before I forget, because I know this was an earlier question, um, and I did reach out to our staff, the, the arborist who uh, accompany us on site is a uh, West Coast arborist, consulting arborist, ISA certified, and also ISA tree risk assessment qualified. So we use the arborist not just for the um, evaluation for um, tree health, and guidance on trees, but also for risk assessment on trees. So I just wanted to add that because that was a question earlier that I said I would mention again. Um, so a couple of things did come up in the public comments. Um, number one, the need for a tree replacement plan. And the, the commenter is correct. Uh, typically a tree replacement plan would be submitted with the application. Um, now what I've spoken with staff, I also myself learning um, through this process here, and we learned a lot through this particular application, of course, um, is that uh, typically we don't have the situation where you have so many replacement trees. Um, in, in this case, you know, and typically you'll have like one or two tree removals, which might constitute, you know, two or four replacement trees. And so what staff will typically do is they don't necessarily ask for a plan up front. They establish with the applicant that there will be a replacement need and they talk about what that will look like. And then once they get through the permitting process, they sort of figure those steps out. In this case, because the trees are so significant, for example, that the oak tree um, measuring all the individual trunks, I think we calculated to be 91 inches. And in our tree code, you know, for every 10 inch caliber of a tree, you're talking about a two tree replacement. So you can imagine you're talking about dozens and dozens of trees on the site. So in other circumstances where we've seen trees not be replaced on the site, it's usually in the circumstance when um, it's not advised that all the trees get replaced on site. So for example, if a tree gets removed simply because there's not enough room for that tree, and we've had circumstances where two trees are too close to each other. And so the, the arborist will advise to remove one of the trees so the other tree can survive. Um, there might not be a location to replace the other tree because um, there's no vacant site as we would call it. And in those circumstances, we work to try to find a nearby local site to plant the tree. And we try to make it as um, close to the site as possible. The whole idea with having trees like sort of transfer to another site is so that the overall canopy of the area doesn't get reduced. So that's why, you know, there might be an opportunity for somebody to move the site, the tree otherwise. It's not intended to, um, that practice is not intended to completely remove trees from the site and then you know someone can have a treeless site and just pay for them to go somewhere else that's not the intent at all it's big it's supposed to be when there aren't available vacant sites at the location and that can happen often so now oh, 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 oh yeah just so i understand and get that point clear if it's a 91 inch trunk combined combination and it's two trees for every 10 inches, you're talking about like 18 replacement trees? Is that We round up, so you're talking about 20, 20. replacement trees just for that one tree. Okay. Um, so in that circumstance, uh, yeah, I agree in this. We probably should have asked for a replacement plan up front, but I think that staff was following their typical process, mm -hmm. not probably fully understanding the impact of how many trees there would be towards the end of that process. Just knowing that, you know, they basically file the paperwork, you know, we identify the number of trees, there's a deposit put down 
from the applicant to basically buy that number of trees to ensure they get um, placed. Um, so yeah, that would make sense that, and I think that's probably a lesson learned from this um, process was making sure that replacement plans are actually accompanied with the application, especially if we're gonna be coming to the commission for the decision process. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one part of that. Um, it, to answer the question about the timeline, because we're not in the development scenario, there's a specific timeline for non-development replacement. I think it says, looking for my um, municipal code here somewhere in my pile, but I think it's 60 days. And so um, it wouldn't be circumstances where we wait to see what happens to the development because we are not in the development pathway for this process. Mm -hmm. um, it should be completed within that time period, unless there's some sort of extenuating circumstances. There are other, um, code issues with the site that may need to get resolved uh, in order to do that. I don't know that that's a separate um, process that we have to uh, basically um, discuss with our code enforcement group to make sure that we're not, the left hand is talking to the right in terms of the location selection for the sites. Um, but no, there is certainly a, a process to ensure that the replacement's done in a timely manner mm -hmm. um, and it's not delayed till never basically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. A couple of questions. Um, so knowing that it's going to be a large amount of trees and for this proposed site without a, without a plan proposed in a 60 day um, replant <laughs> kind of deadline, um, would that in case, would they be forced to create a plan quickly? Um, would it be would it be preferential to, to have them planted on that property without the development plans in place? With no development plans, couldn't you actually plant that many trees on that site? Sure. Um, so we'd leave it to the applicant to try to, you know, to make the proposed site plan. Um, basically, you would, the removal permit would be conditioned on the replacement plan, like the removal couldn't proceed without the replacement plan. And that's also mentioned in the tree code too, okay. that permit approval can be conditioned on a replacement plan basically. And that, and that could be brought to back to us to review or would that be reviewed by court? Sure. I mean, um, we, uh, if that's the request because you are the approval authority, we could do it that way. Um, or you could allow uh, staff to make that you know, decision with the advisement of our city arborist. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different options there, but uh, in some shape or form, the replacement plan would accompany the removal permit, if granted. And then another question, because I mean, it, it is pretty clear that there is an intent to develop eventually on this site. Um, is I'm imagining that it's a much more costly process to get the tree removal through the planning department rather than a non-development related tree removal. Um, I don't know that it's more costly. I think it's just, it's, it's the same process, really. It's just associated with the um, development and it's associated with the planning commission. So I do this exact same thing, but it's before the planning commission. We have an arborist report. Um, they ask us questions. They talk about the health of the trees, which ones can be saved and which ones cannot be. And then their plan to replace the trees. Um, also something that's somewhat tentative because the development scenario can change. So it, like that happened in this situation, it's usually a commitment to a number of trees versus a specific location of trees. Mm -hmm. And my last question is, if we were to approve the removal and the, the roots were to stay in place, once they get into development, if the roots are impending the development, would they be able to be removed at that point or would it have to go through another process of approval related to the tree? My understanding is that they could be removed, but it wouldn't be without demonstrating that there was um, mitigation to the erosion factor. They would have to show that there's the slope, the slope's been stabilized. Um, there's only so much cutback you can do on the slopes. You know, you can't really modify in that much. They mostly have mm -hmm. to stay um, natural, and then there's different standards for how that is done. Um, but yeah, it would be basically if it was became a development case, it would be replaced with some sort of um, you know, a hillside approved right. uh, development plan. There would be an acknowledgement that the roots are there stabilizing the hill and there's a replacement. 
Need right. And that the hill is at this particular slope and that it should remain at that particular slope. Um, mm -hmm. If unless there was some other, you know, plan provided. Okay. Thank you. Those for, are my own. for those of us who went out to the site, if they don't put in retaining walls all over that place, I don't know how that gets developed. So they're going to have to do something pretty yeah. substantial to make it developable, I think. I mean, unless I'm missing something. I'm I was a special engineer, but I almost, you know, just had to stay steady on the hillsides. I don't know if you all experienced the same thing. I am. I didn't get to go to the site, but I'm yeah. familiar with the area and the, and the the more recent developments and the retaining walls that yeah. are required. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Sagan. Uh, yeah, we could just have discussion also if you like. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, my uh, impression here is that the, I, I, I think that I'm very sympathetic to the public commenters who are, have a lot of concerns about the stability of the hillside and the natural environment and what development will look like. I also don't think that our tree code necessarily empowers us to continue to like add requirements for this particular applicant. So I, you know, I did a little bit of research and it sounds like ISA has a program that um, allows arborists to become like our, it sounds like the West Coast arborist that works for the city has this tr tree risk assessment qualification um, and they use a standard form. And I do think that if we could move our city a little bit further away from more these more sort of discretionary um, subjective criteria to evaluate trees that are, you know, somebody is asking to remove, it would be better, better for everybody, better for the community who could feel more comfortable, that they understand that the arborist, you know, is using this sort of standard set of metrics, it's very thorough, um, and, you know, better for the applicant who would have a, you know, a better, uh, hopefully have a better rapport with the neighbors and would also um, be working from the same set of criteria. So, I, you know, just looking at that report that, and I'm sure your arborist is very, very, very good. It just, but there's just a lot of, um, you know, I can see why there would be so much disagreement because it's not sort of a standard process. So I, I would like to see our commission. I know Amy, Commissioner Jones has been asking for a tree plan. I would like to see our, you know, tree ordinance sort of brought into that conversation so that we can hopefully sort of update it and make it a little bit more um, modern and, and keep with these ISA recommended approaches. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the tree plan probably will come up soon so we can bring that up there. Um, Commissioner Bortz, would you like to? Okay. Um, so let's see. Now, yeah, we can have a more of a free discussion, I suppose, if people would like. I also visited the site. Um, you know, I, I was fairly persuaded by the fact that two arborists were in general agreement with each other. Um, and it was pretty well demonstrated in the discussion there. So I do feel uh, that the motivation for removal is pretty strong. Um, one of the trees has actually fallen on the structure that's there. So um, it's clearly a hazard. Um, I feel like. Um, there is some room for us to discuss the question of replacement and you know what's what's fair there. Um, I, I don't think um, I got a sense from uh, the arborist, certainly not. I, I didn't discuss it in detail, but uh, you know what's considered appropriate for the site. Um, you know um, what's necessary for safety, and it's complicated by this issue of being a not being a you know, a, uh, uh, accompanied by a development plan. But um, I guess maybe Ted, if I could ask a quick question of you. Um, sorry to make you get up and down. <laughs> no problem. Um, so my impression from past tree removals was that if there is a planning process that follows the, sorry, the planning process that follows the NREC process that they just sort of can take our recommendations under advisement. Is that not how this would work in this? Um, it doesn't really have, they never really intersect. I mean, it's either, and that, you know, again, might be something to take a look at in terms of updating the tree code for the future, but it's it, it's prefaced on the fact that either there is development or there isn't, and then it takes those different pathways. So um, in, under normal circumstances, you wouldn't have an advisement from one commission to the other. Okay. 
Um, so we're really, yeah, purely, I guess, as Commissioner Siegel was saying, we're purely focused on the question of a, a non-development plan for removing the trees and, uh, and what, you know, how is the best way to do that? I guess it's removal and then replacement too, because if the obligation is to replace it within 60 days, then that sort of needs to be in place too. Right. In the interest of the developer or you know the, uh, the applicant, it would seem to me that you know they're going to want to do that. You wouldn't want to have them plant the trees and then a year or two later come back and say, oh well, five of these trees have to go because I mean that doesn't make any sense. So I guess I mean the frustration I'm having right now I think is. That again, not a criticism of staff, other than that we've realized now this is an issue. The challenge is that without that plan, it kind of puts everybody in a kind of a strange, puts the commission in a strange place, puts the developer in a strange place in the sense that, well, if they remove the trees, but then they have to replace it within a certain period of time, how do they go about getting that all together in enough time? And who's going to be the one overseeing that? And does the public get to have a voice in what that plan is? I guess that's the. Part. So I'm not sure how to move this forward, other than it seems like one, one idea that came to my mind was, it, because I agree with the chair that from what I saw inside and what the arborist said, there does seem to be a pretty good justification from a safety point of view. Because I'm balancing, again, I understand the neighbor's interest, but I'm balancing the interest of, well, what's happening with it the way it is now and the trees and the canopy and all that. On the other hand, I seeing some of those trees and the angle that they're at and the way they're describing it, if there is another set of rainstorms and those trees go, it could be a lot worse than you know what was what was in place before. So, I guess I'm thinking, you know, if we were moving down the road of saying, well, maybe yeah, okay, we approve of the trees being those four trees being removed, but we're moving in that direction. But we need to see a plan, or we need to have a plan submitted to us that says, here's what is going to be the replacement. In this time period, when it's just a non-development replacement plan, um, I'm presuming the developer would do it in a way that's as consistent as they think they can for purposes of whatever ultimate development they might do. But it would still be better to see that plan than to not have anything and be in a mode to say we're going to approve something and leave it to staff and the neighbors feel like, well, how do we know what's going in? So that's where I'm thinking, but I'm not sure if that works. And right. would and would it be like if, if everything was replaced, if we replaced and we tried to replace many trees on that property within the 60 day period, would we re be right back here again once development happens and they need to remove a majority of those trees for whatever development is going to be in its place since there are no plans at this at this moment? Sure. Um, I don't know. You know. It's a really unique situation to have to understand you know, be going basically through the two cycles, once through the NRC and then presumptively through the development process. Um, I'll say that in either process, the location of the new trees isn't usually determined um, or always determined. It's usually the type of tree and how many that can be put on the site. Um, so I think, you know, we could, that could be a request of the applicant to to describe what's possible working with their arborist and discerning, you know, what is the capacity for the site, what makes sense. Um, and I, but I can certainly see the dilemma, dilemma of, you know, then having development uh, later on. So um, it, it might be an area where you'd want to um, add some particular conditions of approval of the replacement over the permit, if you were to approve it, in terms of like, um, you know, understanding the development will occur, you'll be taking that into consideration in your future, in your plan that you're submitting, something along those lines. Um, but certainly, we just don't have the mechanism to handle a situation like that. And I think that's where we're finding the issue. So I have the code here. Um, the reference to 60 days is under the the penalties section. It actually seems to be specific to discretionary process for violations of the rules, and it's at the director's discretion, as my understanding of what it says here. So it's uh, 34.17 part D. Um, so it, yeah, so it seems quite specific to um, 
payment of penalty related to replacement of, of replacement of trees shall occur within 60 calendar days of the violation. So it's specific to uh, violation of, of rules for removal is my understanding. Sure. So, um, you know, there's some issues with this code, obviously. So I think what happens is even though that specifically says within the violation, assuming that someone you know, violated the code and took down a tree they were supposed to replace it within 60 days. I think our staff has been treating that the intent of the code is to have the trees replaced in 60 days. So there's some other similar issues I'll just point out as an example. Like, for example, um, there's, there's a section that defines, um, that defines significant trees. And then there's another section that um, basically defines replacement for um, non significant trees or something along those lines. But if you were to read it to the letter, you'd see that you'd never have to replace certain types of trees that obviously should be replaced just because of the way the definition works. Um, so there's, there's clearly some issues in the code that as staff, we've defaulted to like what the, we believe the intent of the code is. So that might've been one of those circumstances, but I think you're right that it, by the letter of it doesn't necessarily describe a timeline. Right. Um, but we wouldn't want it to be open, of course. Right. And so I guess what I'm wondering if it does give us more discretion over the replacement process than maybe we're setting ourselves up for right now. I think it does. Yes. Because I, I, I was also compelled by the fact that um, there's a power line just downhill from the largest of the trees and the property owner is liable for damage if there was a big windstorm that would bring that down. So I, I do feel like there's a fairly urgent need, in fact, to, to have these at least that one removed. So I, you know, there's there's a question of of setting up the property owner for trouble if we stretch this out too long. So if we had a, you know, if we had faith in the process of replacement and we felt like it was a good good plan that would preserve the character of the neighborhood and allow for, you know, um, the use of the property, um, uh, then I think um, we should just sort of brainstorm that now and get that you know, just clarified. Uh, yeah, I think that you have the authority to do so. Just to clarify what I was talking about, a significant tree is defined in the code as a tree that's one foot or more, one caliper, uh, one foot caliper or more. Yet in the replacement um, breakdown, it talks about the requirements for significant trees that are less than 10 inches. So it's like, it's um, you know, contradictory. So we will assume that Perhaps the code is referring to mature trees, which are four inches or more, uh, not necessarily significant trees. Because other, if we if we take it to the you know the more liberal interpretation, we we lose trees. So we want to gain trees, and so we have to take that interpretation. So I think in this circumstance, I think you're right that you can make that interpretation um, to preserve the intent of having trees on the site. Yeah, I mean I. I would put to the table or like to recommend that we would go forward with removing the trees, but under the condition that we would be the the tree replacement plan would have to be brought to us for approval to in order to have the trees that are at risk right now removed. That's the most basic. I mean, we can put in into details. I mean, I think ideally this is more of a kind of the chicken before the egg scenario of ideally without the plan for development, knowing that there's development in the future, you know, plan for that it would be ideal almost to wait until then if there wasn't an, an extreme risk. But if you're saying that you think this is an immediate need for them to be removed, then um, I would want our commission to be involved in the tree replacement plan to try to keep re as many trees in the vicinity of the property as possible. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. I mean, effectively, that's saying um, we're conditioning approval or not actually approving. We're actually saying, applicant, please come back with the replacement plan. And what you're going to do to whatever the city requirement is in terms of the number of replacement trees and presumably in this case we'd also want to know roughly where because if he says 20 it's going to be probably 25 or 30 trees if i'm just roughly guessing that 
as big as that property is, you still have to figure out a place for the 25 or 30 trees. Um, and so um, you're really just saying that's that's the direction we're giving you is we're, we're, we're moving the direction of approving your removal application. But in order to do that, we want to we need to see an actual plan for what the replacement is before we actually will give you the final, yes, you can take the trees out. Yes, I mean, in, in my past experience on this commission, most most tree removal permit applications are are indeed come with a replacement mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. So I don't feel comfortable approving it without having an under, Understood. I, I just want to make sure I understand. You're effectively saying, though, you're not actually approving anything right now. You're saying yeah, I, if you, yeah. you're, you're giving indication that that's what we will do. Mm -hmm. But you are not saying we're actually approving it yeah. until we see the plan for replacement and can mm -hmm. review that and approve that. Yeah, I, mean, I think from the from the the multiple arborists, mm -hmm. it, it seems clear that you know, these mm -hmm. trees mm -hmm. are, you know, if not a danger now, could be a danger in the future. Mm -hmm. um, if there was tree replacement in the area, and right. I think that would also um, help some of the neighbors' concerns. Right. But without knowing that that's in right. place, right. I feel uncomfortable approving the removal of the trees without anything. Right. No, I, I understand. I just wanted to get. I, I, I'm in. I think I'm in agreement with what you're proposing. Um, uh, it's just I want to make sure I understood. Any other comments? I mean, I would feel comfortable. Yeah, public public oh. comment is closed, so thank you. I would feel comfortable with the tree replacement plan going to city staff and the city arborist, um, as you know, provided that there's a process for the community members to also take a look at it, and and then if there are, are still issues, it coming back to us. But you know, I defer to others. I would be comfortable with that as well, as long as we can maybe agree to a percentage of trees that from, you know, the average out of, you know, what you're saying, 20 trees, if we agree on a certain percentage that will be on the property, then I wouldn't put it too far back here. But how would we determine that if we don't know? Because they all have to go on there unless there's no room. Yeah, um, that's that's the way we've approached that is if there's some sort of circumstances that prevent the trees from being on the property, then they can be moved to another location that's close to the property. And then, you know, it cascades from there. If there's not like fishing close, they go a little farther. Sometimes some trees have made it into the closest nearby park because um, let's say it's like a parkway tree and all the parkway sites are full or they're not um, viable, then the tree winds up being in the next like park. But um, that was what we have to look at that with the arborist. My, my sense would be we're better off having it come back to this commission with a plan. I mean, because of those issues and because of the sensitivity of concern over what replacement trees will go where, um, that'd be my sense is that we're better off having that come back. And so I guess, Mr. Gerber, is it, I mean, would it be appropriate then for us if we do that to? Uh, have a motion that basically continues this, but uh, with the direction to you and to work with the applicant to uh, have the applicant complete a replacement tree plan as sort of the back end of what the removals are are uh, going to entail in terms of mitigation, and then have this come back. I mean, I, I think we're I'm comfortable. Uh, I don't know if the whole commission is. I'm comfortable with the removal side. I think the replacement side is the side that we're all. I'm at least having the most concern about at this point. Yeah, that's certainly a direction we can take. I, I guess I do appreciate Commissioner Husagen's point, which is that it just if we can give a sense of our our um, our preferences, you know, some sort of broad guidelines and we can avoid having to hear it again. You know, I mean it's just nice to have the we want to make sure we respect the process of having it be public and having input, but we also don't want to have it be mm -hmm. such an onerous process that someone feels like they're being really mm -hmm. with the ringer, even though it's sort of best intention. So I, I guess my feeling is that if we can just say something up to the effect of, you know, we would like the applicant to have a plan um, that, um, you know, uh, meets the city's recommendation in terms of replacement ratio or the by the size. And, um, you know, on a best effort basis, have, um, have, this, have them included on the site and uh, in the nearby, in the hills area, um, if necessary, right? So is, is that a sufficient sort of guidance that it would, that it would provide, uh, that it would let the staff take the, take the subsequent iteration on this? 
Um, <laughs> I, I'm just trying, I'm trying to think of like the last bigger, you know, more contentious tree removal issue that we had, which was with the, the school district um, tree removal and where they did not want to replace any trees on their property. And once it became clear that it was the intention wasn't really there to replace on property and they did the most minimal effort and we confronted, they, you know, they were able to opt out. And the, the I mean, I don't even. I just, just got in here, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm like, I'm not calling you at a fault, but like the city staff was very lenient on that part. Like it was more of the commission that came into play of, of not recommending. Um, that they just are replaced anywhere. What we found in that circumstance was really unique. If I remember, it was like my first week here was that um, I think that because of the state, like the state oversight of the school district, we didn't actually have the jurisdiction to apply our municipal code. And they, yeah, they basically were like, well, we were just coming here to be nice. So we don't have to now. Thank right. you. We'll do what we want. Um, I know that we're not in that same situation here, but. I still would like to keep it open to the public, but in the interest of, I also would like to keep it moving forward too. I, I do sympathize with the owner of trying to, you know, the, this is an arduous process to keep it costly. Um, and, and I do feel like we're all satisfied that these trees do need to be removed. So I don't think when we get brought back as a replacement plan that it's up for discussion about if these trees are removed or not. It's really about what the replacement plan is, mm -hmm. you is, know, as far as public comment or any any of that concerns that where we would be just discussing mm -hmm. the, the proposed replacement plan. Ted, what is the remedy uh, that the city can um, put on the owner if the trees are removed and there is he just says, decides not to do it? What happens? What what's the remedy? Um, there's, uh, penalties basically. I think, I don't, I think they might be, look to see here if they are, um, you know, there's penalties, but then they can also be guilty of a misdemeanor. And so that it becomes up to the city's prosecutorial discretion as to whether they want to prosecute the misdemeanor of the penalty. Um, so help me understand. Maybe it, it, is it a is it an approval if it's an approval to come back to us? I guess I'm a little I'm not quite clear on what what it means. I think no. Commissioner Tom had proposed that the plan would be presented first before the trees were removed. Correct? Right, and I, 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 I what I proposed was a motion that would say that we're directing staff to work with the applicant uh, to put together have the applicant put together a tree replacement plan. Uh, my understanding would be that the desire of this commission would be to have as many of the trees be on site as possible, understanding that the developer is intending, I mean, the applicant is intending at some point to develop the property with the idea that we're going to minimize the number of plant and removes, you know, for the replacement trees, and that uh, the there is not an approval of the removal permit until such time as we see a plan for the replacement and um, we approve of that. I, I get, doesn't that mean we would have to see it again? No, it doesn't. Yes, like it does. Uh, oh, okay. But I, I, I think that if we do otherwise, I think that it has the potential then to leave uh, us out of the picture in terms of the replacement plan, and it leaves the public out of the replacement plan in terms of seeing what the idea for the replacement is. And again, understanding from Commissioner Hammond that generally for these tree removals, we see a replacement plan that doesn't seem unreasonable. I'm not trying either to delay the applicant other than it's hard for us to approve something not knowing what it is the end the back end of it in terms of mitigation is even in terms of the number of trees let alone where they would so that'd be my motion Melanie's is going to have to then capture okay. that. Inside. Okay, before before we <laughs> make a motion, <laughs> before we make a motion, one quick question to Ted. Again, um, was there anything in the Arborist report about the um, how how much of a hazard it proposes in the short term, or is it just a general hazard? 
like I, I, I'm just trying to understand for timeline purposes, if we go down this road, are we setting up, you know, is, is there a hazard that we are not taking care of, taking care of that we should be in the short term? I don't think there was any um, basis of time applied to the, to the trees. And I don't know that that um, that's something that they can make a determination on. We have had on other circumstances, we have had um, some event happen and then an arborist will give us a recommendation like it's advisable to remove this tree now. For example, if a tree next to another tree falls, now the wind dynamic has shifted, the soil has shifted, now it may make sense to take down this other tree. Um, so we haven't been given anything that's like, a, you know, remove the steady state of the circumstances of the trees. Uh, not that they aren't, you know, imminently going to fall or dangerous, but that hasn't been anything that, that I recall has been express. Thank you. Uh, sorry, there, but there is, so there is also the applicants, um, there's a replacement plan on the application, I see. It says 90 days with an issuance of a permit, replacement trees must be planted. Um, I mean, if we were just to provide a number of replacement trees, would we be, would we be done here? They would, if there was just a number provided, then they could replace it anywhere they, they wish right. within the city, not necessarily on the property. Right, right. Wait, wait, but is that true though? I thought it was, it has to be on the property unless there isn't room. So I, I think, um, uh, Chair Law, you're reading the application. I am, yeah. Um, so again, I think that as the, code has changed over time maybe the application hasn't oh no and so i have to we'd have to look at that um to see what's the requirement but let me take a look here could, could i ask a question that. to the property owner of if, i think if you do then you might have to reopen this oh okay please so do shouldn't, shouldn't. i think you can of an applicant without opening public comment i think you're able to do that when is your intent to put together a replacement plan for the trees and do you have intent to plant and how many trees on the property do you have any of that knowledge now is that dependent on the plans for the house let in, me in, say er, and like why why didn't you include one in your application this is the enchanted forest there are 29 trees on this lot i'm only taking down four there are four big ones but i'm only taking down four uh, which leaves a lot of trees. So to plant 30 some more trees beyond those like last 25 makes for a lot of trees on the lot. Uh, you can only plant trees that are so close together. So I would be very happy to put in a plan for reforestation of this lot if you would like, but it can't, uh, the lot just can't handle 50 trees. No, I, I understand a, that, sir. That I say, wasn't my question. There is a, um, I have, my understanding of the code is I have to put down a, a substantial sum of money, which I forfeit if I don't plant those trees on my property and Ted gets to plant the trees or use the money however he wants. So I'm not inclined to su support planting trees all over South Pasadena. I want my trees on my lot too. Um, but I will have to give you more of a kind of a reforestation plan rather than just a replanting plan, if that would be okay. Uh, the spirit of the law is have more trees. So I'd be happy to have more trees, but maybe not 50 trees. Right, right. No, my, I mean, I think my question was more directed to why you didn't have a plan. I mean, I know I, I hear your justification is that you have a lot of trees right. in the property, but your justification also tends to lean to me feeling like you have no intent to plant more trees on your property. Oh, I have an idea. You, you do have an idea. And, and oh, why yeah. wasn't that submitted with the plan? Or the, well, the it person? wasn't, I didn't see, I didn't see that it was required. So, so I didn't submit it. Okay. So, but I'll how, so you do have a plan in mind. How yeah. quickly do you think you can bring that plan back to us to review and do? Oh, by your next meeting, easy. Okay. But I just want you to understand it might be, you I don't think our intent is a reforestation is to, rather than mm, replacement. Correct. I I, okay. I don't think our commission is interested in you planting 
the full amount on your property, but we need to see an intent that there's at least a, a, a decent amount of replacement on your actual property. Understood. Yeah. No question. Yeah, in, in reading the code, I, you know, I interpret it as the default as the trees are on the property, because as it talks about replacement plans, it talks about describing the replacement on the property. Um, the, the practice that our staff has taken on in trying to find other locations for the trees when they can't be put on the property is just, again, in following with the intent of the code to try to maintain the urban canopy in, the, in that area of the city. Any other comments from commissioners? Commissioner Tom, do you need to restate your motion? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would just second it. And I, would. <laughs> I, I, I am comfortable seconding. I just don't know if you had captured it in the first. I'll second Commissioner Tom's motion. Do you want me to restate it? Maybe restate it, please. Yeah. Uh, the motion is to direct staff to work with the applicant to have the applicant uh, submit a replacement tree plan um, that would identify, would explain what the applicant is intending to do relative to the city requirements for replacement trees for the four trees that we're talking about having removed. And uh, you know, there would not be an approval of the removal permit until such time as this commission has a chance to see the replacement plan, what it is the applicant's indicating. The applicant has indicated that they will be able to get that plan to us by the next meeting. And so the idea would be to have it, this meeting continue to the next, the, have this matter continue to the next commission meeting and then we will hear it and, and obtain public comment and, and make a decision. And will you second that again? I second that motion. Is that okay? You clear? That's okay. Right. So let's fine. let's have a. Can I make a little, just a little proviso, which is that we are uh, not going to entertain another set of public comments about the tree, the four trees removal. I mean, our, we can have public comment about it, but we have decided to that we're going to approve the removal of four yeah, trees. The, the direction okay. of the uh, yeah, I would understand it to be that the direction of this commission is to to move in. in the direction of removal, but it's contingent on approval of a plan. Yeah, that's right. Okay, plan. just making it clear. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. So we can do a roll call. We the motion was by Commissioner Tom and seconded by Commissioner Hammond. So if we could have a roll call, we have Chair Law. Yes. Vice Chair Hammond. Yes. Commissioner Bortz. Yes. Commissioner Hussagan. Yes. Commissioner Jones is absent. We have Commissioner Siegel. Yes. And Commissioner Tom. Yes. The motion passes six to zero. Oh. And if we could move to the next item, whenever you're prepared. Let's see. Let me get my notes up. Yes. So, um, um, right. So, item three on the agenda is an action item: approval of the minutes from October twenty fifth meeting. Um, I was not present, so those of you who are present, you can take a chance to review that and um, provide any corrections if necessary. I'd move approval. Second. All right, roll call, please. I'm sorry, yeah, we're not going to entertain more discussion. I, I feel like it's opening up an argument and we're not going to do that here. This is, a, this, is a, this is the process that we have in the city and I'm afraid that we've made our decision and we're moving on. If, we, did, we did hear your recommendation of an of a independent art and considered it in our decision. We did. We heard, we heard you in your public comment. The we we not about the removal of the trees. I'm sorry, only about the replacement plan. Yeah. 
you're definitely free to make any general pu public comment at our next commission meeting that's not related to items that are on the agenda. Sorry, we're gonna move on now. I'm sorry about that. I think I think the commission's aware of the commission's aware of all of the input, including that and other comments. So we we have considered it carefully, and it's our decision. So please respect that. If he says all the trees gotta go, I'm fine. I'm sorry, we're on to a different item now. So thank you. Please come back if you would like to make another comment. So with the uh, minutes, um, did someone move? I, I, I moved. Okay. And I believe Ms. Spiegel. Uh, okay. It's been a, a roll. We, we do a roll call on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we did that. Okay. We, we didn't take a roll call. call. Okay. Let's do a roll call on that, please. Okay. So who was the motion by and who? I, I made the motion. Tom moved. Commissioner Siegel seconded. Thank you. So first we're going to go with Chair Law. Yes. The approval of the minutes. Oh, I will abstain. I will abstain. I was not present. Okay. And then we have uh, uh, Vice Chair Hammond. Abstain. I wasn't abstain. present. And then we have Commissioner Boards. I also have to abstain. Abstain. Commissioner Usagin. Yes. Approved. Commissioner Jones is absent. Commissioner Siegel. Yes. And Commissioner Tom. Uh, yes. Thank you. Votes well tied. Uh, but but the, yeses and I think the abstentions mean it. The abstentions, yeah, abstentions, abstentions you don't count. So three yeses, okay, three no passes. Thank you. Okay, and now we can move on to City Council uh, liaison communications. And our illustrious mayor is not present. Uh, Commissioner communications. Um, maybe we'll start. We'll go down the row here. Uh, Rona, of course, would you like to go first? Oh, sure. Um, so I'm, um, I sit on the committee for the ad hoc committee for the parks and recs piece. And since we lost, um, uh, Bill, oh my gosh, I forgot his last name. Yeah, Bill Kelly from that, um, I think we were supposed to, um, appoint another NREC person for that. And so I just wanted to bring that up that we should. Absolutely. Everybody... I was going to refer to this in the staff communications, oh, but if you'd me. like, we could talk about it now. Okay, cool. Um, there is a position on the ad hoc committee for the recreation um, leased facilities, um, and their meetings are the first Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. at the Senior Center. So if you would like to be appointed in this position, we need one member on our committee to take this position. Ted may speak on it. Yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Bortz and Melanie's. Um, so I... I I think the probably the best way to handle is if there's anybody who's interested in the position and then we can refer the appointment to the um I think it might be done by the council because it's a council appointed ad hoc versus a commission appointed ad hoc which would be like you know it's not a sub of this commission so if there is a um interest in that we could hear that and then pass that information on to um and I, I'm not that familiar with it, uh, Commissioner Bortz, you might want to mention, all I know is that they basically review leases in, in some of the city-owned facilities like the golf course and the batting cages and things like that. Yeah. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. We've worked on um, uh, approval for a batting the batting cage, a new uh, um, management company for that, and the tennis court area, um, that's also kind of taken care of, but the exciting one is the golf course and all that business, and it's a it's a it's a hot topic. But we could really use some um, some good, strong environmentalists against well for the golf. What's that? The stables are really great. They're in great condition, and the, uh, the lease is great. I think they're just extending that, but that was also part of it. Um, 
but right now, yeah, it's mostly the the golf course, community golf range, and restaurants. So it's very exciting. <laughs> it's a nice group of people too, and you get to meet a city in your center. So are you not are you not able to deliberate unless someone steps up? Is that part of the requirement here, or? Um, you meaning like uh, can the ad hoc committee not deliberate without? I think they're just looking to have a full yeah. committee. I think it's two members from several various yeah. committees. And so right now there's only one from this. We just lost someone from the finance committee too. And I think they're looking for, so our commission for this. And, uh, you know, ad hoc committees um, have the same Brown Act authority as commissions in terms of advisement. So they are public meetings and, you know, quorums necessary and that type of thing. So having enough members is important. When are these, and how long do you think the discussion of the golf course will go? Since um, it's, hot? it's gonna be a while. <laughs> it's a big thing. <laughs> you're you're enticing people. Into it's this. well, it is. I mean, it's it it is exciting to. Um, I mean, it's the first at, the first Thursday of every yeah, month. Yeah, first Thursday of every month, um, seven o'clock. We're usually up by nine for sure. Um, but it's you know it's a process where you know kind of rethink that area down there. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have some, you know, some input in that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's once a month, right? Well, yeah. First, first, yeah. First, first, first yeah. Um, yeah. It is, I'd heard at one point, one of the ideas, or maybe this was from Commissioner Kelly at the time, that, that a brewery type of place is going to maybe there's consider taking of, over. I'm, I'm trying to entice yeah, some, <laughs> some of the other commissioners. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, I think there's a lot. Um, uh, you know, we've got a heavy, we've got a parks and rec person, we've got finance people. Mm -hmm. And having a, another approach, you know, of, of maybe rethinking, I mean, I don't think I can being conscious of water golf, use but, and yeah, yeah, environmental stuff and and making it um, you know a a fun place that people mm -hmm. in the community can visit, but maybe not so fun that everybody visit. It's like it's a fine line, but it's 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 been really interesting. I've never I don't understand. I'm learning a lot, and I don't I don't really appreciate golf. As, as much as I do now. But anyway, anybody want to do it? I mean, if no one else will do it, I will step up. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Commissioner Siegel. We'll make sure to get your information passed along. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no more comments. Thought that that was your comment. Okay, my um, comments are: I missed out on free mulch. I got there too late. It was all gone. So I hope we'll invite Athens back to give out more or compost, whatever they were giving away. I didn't get it, um, but I did get a um, bike from Active SGV. Very cool program. I got a text. They said we have, you know these bikes, you can rent one. And if you're not ready to like invest, make the big investment. And so, and then they delivered it on Saturday and I rode it here tonight. So it's a cool program. They said they have a whole bunch of bikes. Um, I think they said they have like 800. So like, let people know if they want to try it. You, there's no long-term commitment. You can just sort of decide you're done with it and send it back. What's the price? It's like $70. Is it like 70? It's like $70 a month. And then there are student discounts and just, and there's a different rate schedule i believe for people who receive you know public benefits mm -hmm. of some kind and and just as best, it's an e-bike right? it's an e-bike yes yeah. sorry yeah 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 uh nothing okay well uh commissioner tom broke the bad news to me today that he had to come directly via his his combustion engine yeah um to the nrac meeting but but um, but i but i walked last month so yes i appreciate i appreciate it. he remembered enough to do that um if those of you you know are interested, uh, really like to have my first my my year as chair uh, lead to uh, an all all human powered electric powered attendance for the NRC commissioners. So um, please keep that in mind for our next uh, regular meeting, and perhaps you can get an e-bike for very low cost uh, to bring yourself here next time. Um, and that's all I'll say. Thank you. I walked here tonight.
I have no other comments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't have any. Okay. Um, and uh, staff is on communications. I can start. Um, so the first item was appointing somebody for our ad hoc committee. And thank you so much, Commissioner Siegel, for stepping up. Um, next, I wanted to let everyone know that we're having an electric leaf blower demonstration on next Tuesday, December 13th. It's going to be at Garfield Park, right? And we're going to have a food available. And it's going to be discussing a new program that's going on that gives gardeners up to 70% off on commercial products, electric products. So um, with our new ban coming into place, our electric leaf blowers, um, we're encouraging everyone to just drop in anytime between 8 and 1 p.m. if you're available. Just spread the word if you can. We're going to start promoting soon, and we have our flyer that we're going to be posting online. Thanks, Melanie. Um, to that item, uh, and Melissa mentioned, uh, so we have a, the December 13th event plan, and then we're looking forward to actually having another event in February 8th. And uh, Melanie's is working now on actually doing a uh, utility bill mailing in which we can notify uh, people about those events and also provide some guidance to the public about the ban on gas powered leaf blowers. Um, because as you know, uh, we had been hoping for some incentives for the public in order to make the enforcement more effective. And now that that is underway, and that there is this um, available funding, uh, we will be moving into the um, more strict enforcement arm of the of the ban uh, next year. So that will be part of the mailers that will be providing in the um, Athens mailing and the Muni billing mailing that is both information about the demonstrations and also guidance for residents. So there will be an outreach and notification about how to get the rebates and the, the funding ahead of time before the the more enforcement comes into play. Exactly. And also some helpful tips about um, you know, avoiding enforcement penalties, such as, you know, encouraging your gardener or landscaper to switch or perhaps purchasing the equipment on your own and allowing them to rent it or charge batteries at your home or switch to a rake and a broom. Um, so we want to provide some guidance and also um, some information about the. And and sentence. will we have that? I know we had discussed it before when we were talking about the that it was more of a kind of a replacement plan to get that big um, kind of buyback. But um, is there a steep discount for batteries as well if owners wanted to buy those? And yeah, I think it's. Um, I I want to say it's. Uh, like electric equipment or maybe up to two batteries or something like that. I, I'm trying to remember. It's the um, California Core program. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to, if you search on that, um, that'll describe what the eligible equipment is. And it, was that, is that English and Spanish translations also for the flyers? Yes, we're doing English, Spanish, and also Mandarin on the flyer. Um, the only other item I had is I know the commission has requested that we keep you informed about the happenings of other commissions. So I'll just briefly talk about that. Um, we had our, well, we had planned on having our public works um, commission last week was also a special meeting because we had a, we had to cancel because of a, of a special council meeting earlier in the month. Um, we actually didn't have a quorum, so we weren't able to hold the meeting, but the, um, our intent was to actually discuss the uh, wrapping up of the study of the West Side Reservoir and the Southwest Hills. And so our uh, recent structural and seismic evaluation of that reservoir has found that it indeed needs to be replaced. And in fact, uh, we need to operate it a little bit differently um, in the meantime because of the seismic impacts that could happen at the reservoir. So we've already made those operational changes and we're, we'll be coming to council hopefully in January with um, our report presentation by the consultant and then also a plan to move on to the next step of the capital improvement process of replacing that reservoir. So that was the Public Works Commission. Um, we had the Mobility um, Transportation Infrastructure Commission um, earlier in the month. I'm trying to remember what month it is right now. I, sorry, last month in November. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a public outreach um, and public discussion about our next uh, large transportation project. 
So as I had probably mentioned in a previous meeting, we had just completed the intelligent transportation system deployment of equipment along Fair Oaks, which included a new fiber optic line um, and in included upgrade, upgrading the traffic signal controllers, basically the computers that control all the, well, nine of the intersections. And then along with that, we upgraded some of the detection equipment. So um, we added some uh, vehicle radar equipment, but then we also added some infrared um, cyclist equipment. So now that the signals along um, Fair Oaks can be triggered by um, cyclists, uh, I think in the east-west direction. Um, and uh, I think it works in the north-south, but it's basically kind of um, red as vehicles, whereas on the east-west, um, there doesn't need to be vehicles. It can just be a person. Um, and so our next phase of that project, uh, this is a little complicated because um, we have this federal Rogan fund money that's basically been ours for close to 20 years, um, but hasn't really been connected to, it was connected to the um, loop ramp or the hook ramp project for many years. Um, and then a couple of years ago, council reassociated to a specific Fair Oaks project. It's still federal highway money. So there's restrictions on what we can spend it on. Um, and it's already, it's highly restricted. Um, so uh, the uh, recent plan was to spend that on uh, three things, which was additional ITS components in, in, in um, intelligent transportation systems, specifically for pedestrian focused um, detection systems. Um, and then also ADA compliance along the ramps. And then the third item was supposed to be a, uh, changeable message signs, which would be deployed at various points in the city and basically tell you, you know, the delay from going from one place to the next. We as staff are recommending to not implement the changeable message signs and put that remaining money back into the ADA improvements and the ITS um, improvements, um, the, basically the technology along the corridor. Um, that's a difficult thing to do because the money's already set uh, we had a meeting with um, Caltrans and Federal Highway today that they are um, slightly open to us doing it that way. We just have to basically convince them that change message signs are not really a modern tool anymore. Everybody has you know apps on their phone telling them how th long things. We don't need to actually add that infrastructure into the city. So that's our approach. So um, our discussion at MTech was to talk about that transition and talk about us trying to um, reprioritize that money and it actually we had a number of things we wanted to talk about but the focus was actually on um, the community driven focus was on the bulb outs along fair oaks and what to do with them um, in some cases uh, we were looking at reconstructing them to make it to more um, efficient for both pedestrian cycle and vehicle traffic um, in some cases removing them where they might not be appropriate anymore so we didn't make any decisions about that. What we were trying to accomplish during that meeting was talking to the public about us deprioritizing the changeable message signs and reprioritizing those other things. So the bulb out um, curb extension kind of fell into the ADA compliance area of the funding. If we were going to be redoing the ADA ramps, then we would want to take a look at you know fixing curb extensions and bulb outs at the same time. So. Um, we don't have any decisions made on that yet. Uh, our next step is to do a, um, a larger outreach meeting that we would have at an offsite location. Uh, and so our, our team is working on that, our consultant team. And then we're also going to begin the traffic um, signal synchronization part of that project, which allows for the various phases along the corridor um, to synchronize the traffic and then also allow for intervals for pedestrians and cyclists to move uh, also through Fair Oaks. So that's where we are with that um, project for now and another commission. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you. And that brings us to the end of our communications. Um, the last item is a list of two upcoming events, which you can read in the agenda packet. And I will suggest that we adjourn here at 849.